series. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bible to the last book of the Bible, to the book of the Revelation, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's look at chapter 1, verse 1. God does want to spend you. He wants to invest in you, first of all. He wants to uh, add to you. He wants to increase your value. He wants to add to you and build you up. He wants to pour things into you. He wants to make an investment into your life. He wants to share things with you. He wants to give things to you. Now, I'm not preaching the uh, prosperity gospel. It may not be that he wants you to buy, drive a big fancy car or have uh, diamond rings on everything. He may not want you to be wealthy. Primarily, God doesn't. Uh, is not all that interested in increasing you financially. You know, I, let's just be honest about that. God has, you know, there are people in the world that, that God wants them to accomplish and to do things, and they're going to need money to do it. And so God might give them great wealth. But it's not so that they might have a, their own personal enjoyment of life. He wants to spend their money. He wants them to accomplish or do something for good and for Him. For good and for God. But uh, I think for most people in the world, God is not all that interested in, in increasing us financially or improving us in all the different kinds of ways that we probably would like to be improved, increasing the size of our bank account. Of course, God is interested in meeting our needs, and he is interested in helping us and ministering to us, and, and uh, he, he, well, does, uh, he is a great deliverer. He is a great provider. But sometimes, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, sometimes he wants us to be in want, and sometimes he wants us to lack. Sometimes he wants our pockets to be empty because that's the only time that we'll look around at things and see the true value in other things besides material things and things of monetary value. There are a great many lessons to learn in life and a great many good things to be done, and God is a creator, he's a maker, he's a doer, and he is interested in reaching out into this world and pouring himself into it. He, he made us and he created us and he is the source of all things good. James says that he is the father of lights and all good gifts come down from him. I believe that and I believe that God intends good for us. As we, we began a series in the book of the Revelation last Sunday, we, we looked at how interested God is, how, how eager God is to get across to us, to get a message to us, to to reach out and find us, to grab hold of us. He's a great deal different than we are. He's not, he's not like us at all, and so he has to go to great means. He has to, he has to go to great lengths in order to reach out to us and to reach down to us. And the very best way, the greatest way, the supreme way of all ways in which he reached out to us and reached down to us was through his son Jesus. John tells us in his first chapter of the gospel, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of the Father, he's declared him to us. We'll find God in Jesus. And God wants to speak to us. He wants to talk to us. He wants to touch us and move us and change us and save us through Jesus. And eventually he's going to bring us into his very presence through his Son. Well, do something I've, I don't know that if I've ever done uh, before as a message. I want to preach a message on a topic this morning that I've, I, I don't recall ever having preached on. Let's look at Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John says that these things in the book of the Revelation are at hand. And he also uses the word prophecy. There are many paradoxes in the scripture, and sometimes we think of prophetic things as foretelling the future. Things that have not yet come to pass, and certainly he is talking about those things, but he's talking about things also that he says are, are going, are in the process of beginning, even as John wrote these words. Now this is the Apostle John, who was one of the twelve apostles, one of those who walked and lived with Jesus those three and a half years when he was here during his earthly public ministry. 
Remember, Johnny was uh, James and John were the brothers that were called the sons of thunder. They were the sons of a man called Zebedee, and they were fishermen. They were not great theologians or prominent citizens. They just lived there at Capernaum, and they were fishermen. And here, one of the most uh, amazing stories is going to unfold, and God is going to, uh, to, to get a message through to us by using John to deliver this. Now, the word for revelation is the word apocalypsis, apocalypsis. And we have come to use that English word that in our English language, that, that word in our English language, though it is a Greek word. And it means an unveiling or uh, in the sense, uh, revelation in the sense of something is covered with a, a banner or a cloth and we uh, peel back a corner of it to take a peek. You don't get to see it all, but you get, you get to see part of it. We've come to think of an apocalypse as uh, gloom and doom, the end of the, of the world. Something is spoken of today commonly as being apocalyptic if it has the potential of destroying everything. That's not really what it means. Apocalyptic or symbolical language is used here. And the language is not presented to us to hide things, but actually to reveal things. God is not trying to cover things up. He's trying to pull back the corner and give us a peek. And what he wants us to see is Jesus, because what Jesus wants us to see is God. You see, here we have, we have John, who says, I was an eyewitness of these things. This is what he told me. This is what it says right here. This is what I saw. Don't make the mistake in believing, however, that the book of the Revelation is only about the future. The book of the Revelation tells the story of redemption and the story of the victory of God in human history through His Son, Jesus Christ. You'll find that if you look in Revelation chapter 12, you'll see that the birth of Jesus is told about there. And there are things that were happening that are in, in John's day that are told about in this book. And so the book of the Revelation tells us about since Jesus came until He comes again. And the book of the Revelation is not only about some unknown future or some veiled future, but it's about the whole story of Jesus from the beginning of the end, from the time that he was born here on earth in Bethlehem's manger until the time when one day, perhaps even in our own lifetimes, when Jesus will return to the earth as we have sung about today. But in this process of God reaching out to us through his Son, through John, there's also another character in here that uh, has a very important role in this book. Did you notice that person, that that character, that uh, actor in this role, that person who's on the stage? He says he signified it by his angel, by his angel. I want to talk with you today about angels. I've never seen an angel. I've never seen anybody who was angelic though some claim to be. What is an angel? The Bible seems to be filled with references to these creatures, and they are creatures. What, what is a creature? A creature is a created being. They, they're not eternal or everlasting. God created them, angels. They're most commonly referred to in the masculine gender. We, we tend to see them called a he in the Bible, and his, and did that in the sense of, of masculinity. But actually, as we shared with you last Sunday, God is not a man. Angels are not human either. But we've got to refer to them as something. No, they're not little cherubic uh, babies who have little wings and halos over their heads. Uh, that's, that's not angels. Uh, the word, one of the, there are two classifications of angels. They're called uh, seraph and cherubs. Seraph and cherubs. And we, we speak of someone as having a cherubic face, uh, an angelic face. We don't know what the face of an angel looks like, but we know that often in the Bible they just simply appeared to be uh, human beings. But that was just a disguise. They only took on human form. If you'll read the book of Ezekiel, it's, you'll see that sometimes uh, the angels that the prophet Ezekiel saw visions of had uh, the, the head of a, a lion and the body of a bear and wings. The word seraph, we first meet angels in the Bible in the very last verse of Genesis chapter 3 that God put two seraphim, 
in front of the entrance to the Garden of Eden with flaming fire, swords to, to keep men, to keep you and I uh, from going back into the Garden of Eden. The word seraph really just means poisonous serpent. It means, it means fiery serpent. And so the, the, the seraphim, uh, there is a possibility that they look serpentine or like some kind of fire-breathing dragon or uh, we, 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 we certainly have no idea that they look like a, a man or a little baby with wings. The cherubim are seen most often and they most often take human form. But angels, the word angel appears 57 times just in the book of the Revelation. The word, the Greek word angelos is where we get our word angel. And the word angelos just simply means messenger. But strictly speaking, we might, uh, our, our word, even our word messenger is a little bit misleading. That's why it's, a, it's better to translate the word simply angel. Because of messenger, we think it's someone who just talks. Just someone who has a message. Now, they do deliver a lot of God's messages. They are, they're like God's mail men or God's messengers in that sense. But angels don't just talk. As a matter of fact, they act in the Bible a great deal more than they speak. And listen to this. They never sing. Oh, she just sings like an angel. Angels never sing in the Bible. I'm sorry. You look so disappointed. Even the angels that appeared, appeared in the, that field there in Bethlehem to speak to the angels, it says they, they said, Glory to God in the highest. They didn't sing. Glory. They didn't sing. Angels. Angels are not just a myth. They're, they're not just a part of a, a, a little bit of make-believe that is inserted into the Christian story or into the Bible story or to the story about the, our faith. They do seem to be mythological. They do seem to be mysterious. If you look over in Colossians chapter 2, you'll see that Paul warned the Colossian Christians against worshiping angels. So you could really kind of get involved in, in this thing of, of, of a sense that we're surrounded by angels, or that there are angels in the world today, and you could actually become so enamored by that thought and by that idea that uh, you might come to want to develop a relationship or even a, a religion about angelic beings. Now, they're spirit beings. They're not uh, flesh and blood. And even though sometimes they take on appearances if they were one of us, they're, they're not from around here. They, they seem to have existed long before we were created. We don't know anything about their creation or, or perhaps if there was another world in another time. As the boys would tell you, in a, in a place uh, far, far, a long time ago and far, far away in, in the, the Star Wars universe, we don't know anything much about angels in eternity past. But they were already very comfortably in, uh, in place in the scheme of things, in the work of God, and in the, in the universe that God had already created before we ever came to being. There is a possibility that we could become so glamoured by the thought that we might feel that uh, we need to develop that theology about angels a little more deeply. Probably one of the, even though, though he's not a great theologian, but a great evangelistic preacher, Billy Graham uh, in his day has written probably one of the best books that has ever been written about angels. This is called Angels, God's Secret Agents. If you ever get a chance to read that, Brother Billy does a wonderful job with talking about almost every reference in the whole Bible to angels. As I said, they appear here, and, and we might uh, take the opinion, well, uh, I haven't seen much about angels. I haven't seen an angel in my lifetime, but obviously, since the book of Revelation is about the future, obviously angels are going to have a great part to play in the future. But don't forget that this book is about the entire Christian age, the entire Christian era from the first coming of Jesus to his second coming. And they are tremendous instruments of God. God uses them widely. He uses them a great deal. 
this book only has 22 chapters in it, and there are 57 references to angels in the book. No, I don't think we ought to worship them, and I don't think we ought to seek to have a relationship with them. I don't think we ought to try to find them or notice them. I don't think we ought to go on, a, on an expedition trying to uncover them. I don't think we ought to spend time. I don't think you ought to talk to angels or try to start up a conversation with them. I don't believe you ought to try to develop some kind of means or, or, or so grow your spiritual life so that you might have the, the ability to see angels or sense angels. The book of Hebrews does tell us in the 13th chapter there that sometimes we have entertained angels unawares. So that means sometimes there might have been someone that you talked to or someone who crossed your path, someone you, whom you interacted with in your daily life, and there's a, there's a possibility, the, the Bible says there in Hebrews 13, that, that that person was not a human being at all, that maybe they were an angel. Doesn't this sound very spooky and mysterious, and yet it's really just kind of a meat and potatoes way of God working in our world and doing these great things. There are wonderful stories uh, about angels and God's using angels to, to bring about His will. There never seems to be any indication that angels act independently of God. Now there's a longer story about how an angel named Lucifer decided he wanted to do his own thing or to do things his way but that's not a place, uh, there's not a place in this message today about Lucifer and other angels that decided to follow him. That's uh, another sermon for another day. But angels that are within the will of God and are part of the plan of God are, are never conducting their own will. They don't have their own plan. They don't have their own agenda. It seems that they are completely devoted and dedicated to doing what God wants them to do, to doing the will of God. In a sense, there are messengers not just to say things or to carry something that needs to be said, but the word angel might actually better be translated doers. They're doers. Sometimes what they do is deliver a message, but many, many times what they do is they facilitate the will of God. The seraphims seem to be mostly seen in the presence of God, and they protect the holiness of God. And they, they are watches and guards of the portals of heaven and the portals of the Garden of Eden and paradise and eternity. The cherubim seem to be those who interact with us. And I could see it where, as the Colossians did, we might become so fascinated by this idea that it become a distraction. I believe that angels are purposely quiet in many regard. They are, are secret in so many ways. They are always hidden and most often invisible and behind the scenes because it is, it is only important to them that God's will gets done, that what God wants to accomplish is accomplished. I've heard stories and read stories and all different kinds of things about unusual occurrences where people seem to have divine intervention or where there was assistance that seems to defy the normal kinds of things that might happen in a person's life. Perhaps you even have a testimony yourself where you feel that God intervened and there's the possibility that he may have used one of these secret agents in your life to accomplish his will, to help you, to guard you. If you would, turn with me over to the book of Matthew. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. One of the most uh, fascinating aspects about a study of angels is this passage that I want you to look at here for just a moment. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. Angelic beings, angels are the servants of God. But look at it, this is, a, there is a, there's a, 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 an expansive amount of literature and thought and, and uh, uh, thinking and, and, and imagination about this particular aspect of angels. And yet, as far as I know, this is the only place where the possibility of a guardian angel is ever even mentioned in the Bible. Look at Matthew 18.10. Jesus is talking about little children. He's talking about little children. In Matthew 18.10, it says, Take heed that ye despise not 
one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Now there's no indication, we never have any, any indication that, ain't, that, uh, that we have an angel in our adulthood or that as we are older that we have an angel. This is a, a very strange verse. And this is the only verse from which the whole concept of the idea of a guardian angel comes. It says their angel, the, the, these little ones have what Jesus here calls their angel. They behold the face of my Father in heaven. In other words, the, the, don't, don't despise or mistreat these little children because they have a personal angel who is not so much here depicted as being beside them or near them, but they are in heaven, and they are always beholding the face of God. Do you have a guardian angel who takes care of you and watches over you? I don't know. I know that little ones do, and it's not so much that they're there with their wings hovering over that person, but they're standing before God, and they're looking down on those little children, and somehow or another in that sense... Jesus is saying, be very careful because evidently that, that chain from that little child to that angel who's watching and can see God's face on the throne, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to tell you just exactly what that's all about, but he says, be careful. Be careful how you treat little children. I don't believe that that warning is in vain. I believe that if someone mistreats or or harms little children. I think that that angel has something to do with reporting that to God, and God is going to make sure that that does not go. That mis any kind of mistreatment of little ones goes unpunished. I do believe that God works in so many wonderful and mysterious ways that are yet unknown to us. And yet let me bring the, the point of the message to this. I, I, as I began looking at this in preparation for this sermon, I began to think, well, how powerful God is. And you know that when I became a Christian, when I asked Jesus to save me, when I prayed and I said, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart, you know he did? The Bible tells me that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, literally dwells inside my life inside of you if you're a believer every believer in the son of god is indwelled by him jesus said to his disciples he said i'm with you and he says i'm going to be in you now if the idea of an angelic being blows someone's mind think about someone who actually lives his life the creator of a whole universe the master of the universe living his life inside you Paul says that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Now that is a mind of Lord, that the God of all things lives within you. What if, uh, what if an angel, I thought, this is the way I think, what if an angel appeared at the foot of my bed and woke me one night and said, I have a message for you from God. <laughs> and I say, God's in here. <laughs> God's in here. Why would, why would God send you to tell me a message when God lives in my heart, when he lives inside of me? You know, I, I think that so many things happen when someone becomes indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, by the presence of God, and through his, the indwelling presence of His Son in our lives. No, I think if God has a message from you, if there's something He wants you to do or something He wants you to know, He's just going to think it in your heart. He's just going to impress upon you and lead you and guide you, not with the hand of an angel, or He's not going to... Uh, guides you with the sound of the beating of angels' wings because he lives within you. And I began to ask this question, Lord, why do you need angels? God, you have all power in heaven and earth, and Jesus is so powerful. And the power of the Holy Spirit is boundless. Why do you need angels? Lord, if, if there's something that somebody was, help, was, was fixing a flat tire on the highway, couldn't you just reach down there and just fix that flat tire miraculously? Of course God could do that. If there was anything that needed to be done or anything that needed to be said or anything that needed need to be moved or shaken, doesn't God have the power and the ability to just reach down and make that happen? And I thought, well, of course he does. Why does God need angels? And I began to look at all the different things that are spoken of as having been said or done by angels in the Bible. And I said, well, God, you could have done that yourself. God, you could have made that happen. God, 
why these are magnificent creatures, it seems. There's so much mystery and majesty about them. There, there, there seem to be such powerful beings and such gloriously beautiful beings and so enticingly strange to our imagination. But Lord, why do you need angels? And then the answer came to me. Well, God doesn't need angels. God doesn't need angels. But he created them because it was... Uh, it, it pleased them. And he uses them. They are a part of what he does. They are part of the execution of his plan, of his will. They, they, are, they are his creatures. And he employs them and he uses them. And, and God doesn't need them. You know, the very first time I heard someone say, someone said, you know why God created Adam and Eve? Do you know why God created men and women? Why he created us? Because he was lonely and, and he needed someone to have fellowship with. The very first time I heard that, I said, well, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. God was lonely. You see, I know what loneliness feels like, and I don't think God's ever felt lonely. Lonely is a crushing feeling of insecurity and weakness. I don't think God's ever felt lonely. I, I think God created us because it pleased him to do so. Because it brought joy to his heart. But he wasn't lonely. There was not, nothing that God lacked. There was no insufficiency in God. There, there was nothing missing from God's life that we came in and filled. He just did it out because it pleased him. You're going to find that said so very clearly here in the book of the Revelation. Just simply because it pleased him. It made him happy to do so. Why does... No, God doesn't need angels. And this is the point of the message today. You know, God doesn't need you either. He doesn't need me. And yet there's something he created me to do. Could he do it without me? Of course he could. But I'm so glad that in God's working and in everything that God does, he includes us in it. He wants to use us. He wants to spend us. He wants to send us. He wants to make things happen, and yet he wants to to do those things as if we were partners with him in it. He says, come in, let's, let's do this together. This is what I want to do and I want to accomplish it through you. I want to use you. I want to spend you. I want to send you. God doesn't need angels. He could do all that all by himself. You know, I, I can't work on my car anymore. You'll see that I, I've got a fender panel that got bumped off this last week and I haven't even put it back on yet. I used to work on my car and now these modern cars I, I don't know how to work on. I can't even find a spark plug sometimes. I spent all day looking for a carburetor one day in a fuel injected car. Sometimes I can't even find where they put the spare tire. I don't know. Where, where's it at? That's, I know it's around here somewhere. Can't find the jack. <laughs> I used to work on my car but my dad was a, a great car man. He was an auto. He was a, he was a great mechanic and a, a seller of cars, and he knew everything there was to know about cars. But I didn't learn very much from about cars when I did work on them from my dad. My dad was kind of an impatient person. If ever we were working on a car together, I'd be in there with my tools and fumbling and fidgeting, and I didn't really know what I was doing. A lot of times, so many times, I would say probably most of the time, my dad would just say, "Give me that wrench and." Get out of the way, and I, we need to get this done. Now, that wasn't poor parenting on his part, but, but I do wish. My dad had, wasn't a teacher. He, could, he didn't have the patience. It just wasn't one of his areas. And that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that because I eventually learned how to do things that I needed to do, how to change the oil and change the spark plugs and put in some new points and put in a new regulator and alternator, those kind of things. But what if God was that way? What if you were, you and I, you know why we fumble around things and why we, we sometimes make a mess out of things and sometimes we don't just do everything perfectly? What if God standing up in heaven and was saying, well, what a mess he made of that. What, that's, they don't even know what they're doing. What if God reached down and just did everything for us? And I think, well, that'd be great, wouldn't it? No, no, it wouldn't. What would really be great is if he let us fail and let us make mistakes and he let us try and let us, let us do because God takes great joy in seeing us do the very best that we can to do what he made us to do, to do what he sent us to do. 
do what he asks us to do. No, God doesn't need us. But he wants to use you. He wants, there is something that you were born for. And you have great value to him. You're very important to him. He tra- takes great joy. Now, next uh, next week, next Sunday, we would begin our new church year. And everybody's, uh, some people are in the same position that they serve. And some people have embraced new positions of leadership. And I thank you for for taking up that challenge and that responsibility of being used of God here in our church at Walden Chapel. And all this year there have been so many of you have, and there's so much hard work that went on this week and so many different things and putting on a, a bridal shower and, and doing all the work that was done back in the back. You see, you did all that for God. You did all that for God. God used you. And we appreciate it, but it, God appreciates it even more. I'm not talking about things that the news will report about or will wind up on the front page of the Decatur Daily or even in the Alabama Baptist. There are things that God wants you and I to do and he relishes seeing us take them up and saying, God, I want you to use me. Have you given yourself over to him in that way and say, Lord, Jesus, use me. Whatever you want me to do, spend me. He wants to do that. And there are things that you can do. And there are things you were born to do. Don't ever have a feeling or ever a thought in your mind, well, I can't do that. I'm not worth anything. I, I'm not important. I'm not valuable. That's not true. You might say, well, Lord, you don't need me. Well, that's true. He doesn't need angels either. <coughs> Yet they have a pretty prominent place in the book of the Revelation throughout the whole Bible. I don't know what that what angels are all about. I've told you today in one sermon everything I guess I know about angels. And yet I only told you that to say God doesn't need them. He could do everything that they do all by himself. And yet what a glorious place they have all through the Bible doing God's will. That's what he wants to do through you. Let me pray for you today. Father, I want to pray for every person who is in this place today and ask you to confirm in every heart today their great value and their purpose and their place in your plan. Lord Jesus, use us, spend us, send us out. Help us to be messengers. Thank you for the partnership we have with angels their partnership with us. We may never see them or even hear the rustle of their wings, and yet we know that they're all about us. And they're not here so much to help us or to watch over us as they are to, to get your will done. Lord, help us to join in with them. Bless them and their ministry to us as we commit ourselves to get your will done, to do the purpose for our lives in this world. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this world and what you're continuing to do. And thank you that you've chosen to to do that, so much of it, in and through us. Make us vessels of your work. Lord Jesus, we ask it in your name. Amen. Page 347. 347, would you stand as we sing this morning? Father God, may have spoken in your heart today through this message, or our music, our prayers. If God's spoken to you, you come. I want to pray with you, pray for you. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Say your love for us, He's waiting to watch you, watching for you and for me.
That's where home is. Coming home means getting back to where you're supposed to be in, in His will. Getting back on the right path. Getting back in step with Him. Making your life not about what you want, but about what He wants. Folks, we'll never be happy until we're doing what God made us to do and what He intends for us to do in His plan. Heads bowed and eyes closed. In this closing moments of our invitation, all you have to do is the voice of prayer in your heart. You don't even have to speak it out loud. But say, Lord Jesus, help me to draw closer to you. I want to do your will. I want you to use me, spend me. Thank you, folks. You may be seated. I'll ask our ushers to come forward to receive our offering today and place your uh, information slips in there. If there's something you want to communicate to me, if you have a prayer request, please get it to Charlotte. Charlotte's right down here in the yellow blouse. And uh, she will put it in the bulletin for the prayer list for you. Let me make my offering today. I'm sorry, I almost forget. Now, let me share something with you. We're going to be telling you more about this, but it has recently come to the attention of our uh, building committee that we need a new roof on the church. And uh, our, we've had our insurance adjusters come out and our uh, folks who do roofs and those kind of things, and so your, your building committee is on that. And our insurance is going to, going to do a great deal of work for us, and they're going to help us a whole lot. But uh, there are some improvements we want to make and some things we want to do above and beyond that. And so we're going to be asking you to consider and pray about in the coming month. It'll be toward the end of September when the work actually takes place. But if God has blessed you and you can share a little bit over and above your general Sunday offering. Now, we're not asking you. If you're not a member at the Walden Chapel, we're not asking you to give a dime. If you're not a member here, we don't, ask, we, we don't want you to give anything. But I'm just speaking to those of you who are members here. If you can contribute over and above, we ask you to do that. We're going to be having some building fund offering envelopes for you in the coming weeks. And if you can share something extra, we ask you to do that. But only as God leads you to do that. And we're not going to uh, uh, promote it all that much. You just kind of get in on it if you want to. It's there if you can. And if God has blessed you. But let's, <coughs> let's worship Him today with our gifts and our offerings today. And Dave, would you, would you lead us as we pray today? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you, Lord, for the message that we're here. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless. And if there's one, Lord, that needs to make a decision today, we pray, Lord, they'll make it before they leave this building. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless all the sick. And we pray, Lord, that you touch them. And bless, Lord, the families of those that's lost loved ones. We ask you to help them. Go with us now as we go out to receive the morning's offer. Pray that you'll bless it and use it, Lord, for your honor and glory. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins, and all we ask in your name. Amen. <laughs>